Hi everyone, my name is Sara Savur. Uh, I apologize for not being present today due to the visa issues. I will be presenting an introductory talk in a series of talks on capsules and capsule networks. There is a QR code on all the slides for asking questions. Please feel free to post your questions during the talk. I will be answering posted questions after the talk. This will be approximately 40 minutes, and this is not a literature review. I will, however, review some motivations behind the research on capsules. I will introduce basic elements of capsule networks and discuss three variants of capsule networks. These basics will be useful to anyone interested in applying capsule networks to new domains with some modifications. We will have a survey of recent developments and capsule variants in the next sessions. Okay, let's begin. As you can see, QR codes are at the top right for asking questions. Let us start with a challenge. So this is for you, the audience, to solve. Take a moment to look at these nine pictures. In five seconds, you are asked to draw all of them from memory as accurately as possible. So one, two, three, four, and five. Now, patterns. Did anyone figure out any distinctive and shared patterns across all nine examples? In fact, there are groups of points in the shapes of squares and triangles. On this slide, colors are used to highlight these patterns. By the end of this tutorial, we will learn about a system that can find such patterns. It can efficiently reconstruct the input and it is unsupervised. Another challenge is occlusion. Occlusion is a computer vision challenge that is beyond simple pattern matching. Consider the following task that involves occlusion. Similar to MNIST, the task is digit classification. However, instead of one, we have exactly two digits overlaid. The task is to predict the class of both digits. The ground truth labels are shown underneath each image. For example, the first image is a digit of five and a nine overlaid on top of each other. Capsule networks perform significantly well on this task. The third challenge is viewpoint. The third computer challenge that we consider is generalizing to new viewpoints of the same object. Suppose we want to classify objects. At chaining time, we only get front view of the objects, but at test time, the image can be from any viewpoint. Capsule networks can also help us to generalize to new viewpoints. So now let's ask a question. Suppose we call this picture a house. Then we can also call these two pictures houses, slightly transformed, but it's still the same general look. But if you separate the parts from the whole and mix them randomly, it is no longer a house. So the position and structure of lower level parts is important. In fact, we desire a system that is viewpoint equivariant at all levels. A system is viewpoint equivariant if, the, if any viewpoint change in the input results in a similar viewpoint variation in the output. And we want this to happen at all levels. So CNNs without a stride and pulling are translation equivariant, but not viewpoint equivariant. They replicate the computation over the grid of pixel positions equally. If you move the house around, for example, it will not hurt a CNN much. 
But if you change the viewpoint of the camera, CNNs do suffer. The question is, should we stick to CNNs and grid all degrees of freedom in the viewpoint as well? Or should we, for example, find new basis functions and replicate filters or computations in a new basis? A proposed solution is capsule networks. So let's drive capsule networks. As we discussed, in these pictures, viewpoint is varying. But what is staying constant? What is left of the house when we remove the viewpoint? The answer of computer graphics and older computer vision community is to go beyond pixel space into vector space. So put a coordinate frame on all the detectable objects, houses, roofs, walls, everything. The blue coordinate frame shown here is for the roofs, yellow for the walls, and green for the houses. Now look for the constant again. Can you see it? Yes. So take any roof in these pictures. Regardless of its coordinate frame, if you rotate it by 90 degrees and scale it, you can get the coordinate frame of the house. Basically, we can find the coordinate frame of the house from the roof from any viewpoint. We just need to learn the relation between coordinate frame of the house and the roof. So let's ask what is a coordinate frame. A coordinate frame should encode information about the viewpoint, like rotation and scale. Suppose I ask you to put coordinate frames on this chalk and its parts. Here is one way you could do so. I'm arguing that the choice is arbitrary, but coordinate frame of parts have to be consistent with each other. The coordinate frames are multidimensional. A vector or a matrix is a proper representation mathematically for coordinate frames. What we need to learn, however, is the relationship between two coordinate frames. We will represent these relationships using a single matrix. In a neural network, usually we only carry around the information about the existence of a pattern. In addition to that, we want to carry how it exists now. So we introduce a new concept, capsules. From now on, we will call a group of neurons representing whether an entity exists and how it exists a capsule. A capsule can be just six neurons, which we will represent using a single vector. Or it can be 16 neurons formed as a four by four matrix. The points, or any representation, essentially. The point is that any group of semantically meaningful neurons is called a capsule from now on. So we have figured out the constant and variable parts of a house representation. In the house example, we will represent a roof using a capsule and a house using another capsule. And we will learn to find the transformation from the roof capsule to the house capsule. This transformation will give us how the house exists. But how can we detect objects? Is any roof a house? No, a house needs walls. So a house exists if it has both roof and walls. Suppose we know how to transform a roof capsule to a house capsule. We also know how to transform a wall capsule to a house capsule. But the house capsule should only be active if and only if the prediction matches between the roof capsule and the wall capsule. In other words, roof capsule and the wall capsule should agree on their prediction for the house, and then the house exists. 
So let's take a look at what do we mean by this agreement. Consider a digit classification task like MNIST and a model with the following architecture. The model consists of three layers. The first capsule layer consists of seven part capsules. Example parts in a digit are shown in the bottom. Each of these capsules will find their individual coordinate frames. First layer capsules are con connected to the second layer capsules consisting of five capsules. Second layer capsules will be responsible for detecting higher level conceptual parts, such as the image on the right. For example, these are three examples of what conceptual parts they can represent. And we carry the coordinate frame information inside the capsule, not the actual part. Okay, now first layer capsules transform their coordinate frames and send seven predictions to each mid-level capsule. That's what we have decided, to learn these transformations. So they transform their coordinate frames, send their transformations to the next level. Now we want to find agreement between each set of seven predictions. Are these predictions agreeing? Are these the same? But not all predictions on the first layer belong to all mid-level capsules. For example, in this digit three, some active capsules will belong to the red capsule shown as the top part of the tree, and only to that part. Some of them belong to this other mid-level capsule shown at the bottom left part of the tree. We only need agreement between parts that belong to a whole. This means in order to find an agreement, we need to also find a scene parse tree. In a parse tree for a scene, each capsule will get a parent and it will send its prediction only to its parent. A capsule with no child is turned off. Assigning parents is a layer-wise nonlinearity because parents compete with each other. This is a substantial difference between capsule networks and traditionally uh, convolutional neural networks. In each layer of capsule network, groups of neurons compete with each other to find supporting parts. Like this one says, this is my part. The other one says, that's my part. And then within groups, neurons cooperate to explain the parts that they are assigned to them. This will be, um, in what follows, I will be discussing three approaches to finding agreements and assignments between capsules. This will be using dot products, expectation maximization, and mixture models. But before that, I will give a general architecture. So let's complete the architecture of capsule networks by connecting capsules to images and chaining the model. We connect the image to the first layer of capsules with a convolutional layer. Group the output of CNN into capsule neurons. Now all the coordinate frames are transformed into the next capsule layer predictions. These transformations are the only chainable parameters between two capsule layers. Agreement is given a set of capsule predictions. Do these sets of coordinate frames agree with each other? We call this nonlinearity agreements and assignments. If the child parent, uh, if the child prediction agree, the parent capsule gets activated. The parent capsule gets the agreement as the co its coordinate frame. I will explain this fair in further details later. Each last layer capsule is assigned to one class. The existence probability of that capsule is the probability of image be that class. A classification is loss is used to train the network then. Okay, 
Now let's dig into this agreement and assignment and child and parent and everything. The simplest method is using the cosine distance as the measure of agreement. Then set the norm of the coordinate frame to the existence probability of the capsule. Remember, for each capsule, we need an existence probability and a coordinate frame. This was introduced in a joint work with Nick and Jeff at NORIPS 2017. So why does this work? Or how does it work? Let's illustrate each capsule as a vector. The, or the, or the orientation of the vector represents the coordinate frame. The length of the vector represents the uh, probability of existence, just for the sake of visualizing and talking about them. Consider the following two cases. In the first case, the top half of the figure, uh, the vectors have the same orientation. In the second case, the bottom half of the figure, the vectors do not align. What does the sum of these vectors look like? The length of the summed vector will be large if their orientation agree. To keep the lengths as proper probabilities, we renormalize the norm and squash them below one. So summing the predictions and squashing gives the next capsule with an agreed orientation and a length below one. Now that we have done with the agreement, we can refine it with doing some assignments. We use a ransack style refinement. Take these five capsules depicted as vectors, transform them into predictions for each of the three capsules in the next layer. Sum the predictions. This is the initial guess for our next layer capsules. Since orientation is our indicator of coordinate frame, compare the dot product of each prediction with the new capsule coordinate frame guess. For example, consider finding the parent of blue capsule. Take the dot product of all blue predictions with the summed capsules. The one with maximum dot product is the parent of the blue capsule because the blue capsule is contributing most to this purple capsule. Remove the blue prediction for the other two. All the five lower level capsules choose their parents based on the dot product. And send predictions only to their parents. After assignment, recalculate the sum. Since now there is fewer outliers, the next layer capsules are boosted in compared to previous iteration. We call a agreement assignment step a routing iteration. This is a demo showing how after 10 routing iterations, capsules converge to a parent assignment. Here we show bottom level capsules with red circles, top level, sub, top level capsules with blue circles. At iteration one, all red capsules send a prediction to all the blue capsules. Then they select soft parents based on their cosine similarity. Iteration two of the nonlinearity connections get sparser. In practice, using three iterations is enough and we don't do 10, ten iterations. Consider the cluster task to illustrate the power of dynamic routing. This is a similar task to MNIST for classifying digits. But now there are two digits in each image overlaid. The top image, uh, the images here show samples of the input images. The ground truth labels are also shown beneath them. Capsule networks have significantly better accuracy than the baseline CNNs in classifying these images, blah, blah. A capsule has coordinate frames in addition to the existence. That's the interesting part. We further investigate their performance by chaining a decoder on top of the coordinate frames. This is our decoder, for example. The decoder is an MLP to generate 28 by 28 images. On the bottom, we overlay the reconstructed images from the two most active capsules in uh, red and green. So reconstruct from the five 
get a green five reconstruct from the nine get a uh, red nine overlay them on top of each other and the overlaps are yellow shown as the first reconstruction we see that if a pixel belongs to only one digit, it will only get reconstructed using that digit's coordinate frames. Let's take a closer look at these two examples. At the top left, we see an image of overlaid 9 and 5. At the top right, it is a 7 and a 1. The reconstructions at the bottom are from the 16-dimensional coordinate frames. Obviously, they are not Perfect, but they're good. Looking at the corners, we see evidence of proper scene parsing. To explain the small tip at the corners, it does not thicken the other digit as it is customary with CNNs to minimize the reconstruction error. Since the notch does not agree with the parts of other digit, it is not reconstructed from both coordinate frames. So in this case, it's only colored in red rather than a yellow. To evaluate CapsNet viewpoint generalization, after training on MNIST digits, we test them on affine transformed MNIST test digits. And capsules show significantly better viewpoint generalization than baseline CNNs. But using the norm as a measure of existence is problematic. If a coordinate frame is scaled, it should have a larger norm as well. So we need to represent existence separate from the capsule coordinate frame representation. Now we need to find agreement and assignment for this new capsule with separate existence. So far, the length of the coordinate frame was an indicator of existence. In the slides, we use arrows of different length to talk about capsules. Now, each capsule has a separate existence. So from now on, we refer to them as circles with different radiuses. The position of the circle shows the capsule coordinate frame. The radius shows their existence probability. How do we find agreement and assignment when existence is separate from the coordinate frame? Consider 10 low-level capsules shown on the left with different existent probabilities and coordinate frames. From the 10 capsules in the lower level, we want to figure out the next level 3 capsules on the right. First, we compute the predictions by transforming the coordinate frame. Note that these transformations are the only trainable parameters. They are learned by optimizing the classification loss at the end on the existence probability of the class capsules. Previously, we had cosine distance as the measure of agreement. Now the norm is part of the coordinate frame. So we use Euclidean distance as a measure of agreement. If the predicted coordinate frames agree with each other, then they form a cluster. Otherwise, they are scattered based on Euclidean distance. So we fit three Gaussians to find the agreements. We find the center of Gaussians by averaging the points. The black disks shows uh, the Gaussians we get for each set. Their centers are marked with black squares. The math is similar to the maximization step in expectation maximization algorithm for, for fitting a mixture of Gaussians. Now, we take the center of the Gaussians as the coordinate frames of the new capsules. On the right, we show the three new capsules. To refine the capsules, we perform a parent assignment step. The math is similar to the expectation step in the EM algorithm. We choose parents based on which Gaussians explains which lower level capsule best. So for example, the red lower capsule has maximum probability under the pink Gaussian. It is best explained by the pink new capsule. 
So the red capsule chooses the pink capsule as its parent and send its prediction to only the pink capsule. Then we refit the Gaussians again with a maximization step. We recalculate the weighted average to find mean and standard deviation of the Gaussians. A capsule exists if its Gaussian is tied with several points assigned to it. So a Gaussian with large standard deviation or few children gets deactivated, like the new green capsule at the bottom. A tight capsule, like the new red one, is an active capsule, though. Center of the clusters are coordinate frames of new capsules, and their standard deviation are a metric for existence. Let's take a look at how the assignments change in practice for real images during the routing. This experiment is on NORP dataset. Take the image on the right. We want to classify it into one of the five classes of animal, human, plane, truck, car. We are showing the number of predictions near the center of each of the five final layer capsules. At adjacent one, there are some predictions for all capsules near their centers. So all the five capsules are semi-active. At adjacent two, we reassign the lower level capsules based on their fit. Some of the caps uh, class capsules lose support and some gain support and become tighter. After th three EM iterations, the predictions set are correctly on chalk with a tight active capsule. Remember that this is a nonlinearity happening at inference training between each two capsule layers. This shows another example for a human image. Interestingly, after the first step, animal and human get boosted. This indicates that their part whole relationships are similar, which makes sense. We also tested capsule networks on their ability to generalize to new viewpoints. We train on only one third of available viewpoints in the NORP dataset. At test time, we ask it to extrapolate to new viewpoints. We compare capsule network results with a baseline CNN. Capsules have significantly lower test error in this task. So currently, at each step of training and inference, we are transforming and then running a loop to figure out centers. Can we do this without iterations? A new idea is to bypass the fitting and leave it to an MLP to figure out the capsule coordinate frames and perform the distance metric function, everything. Then the top capsules transform their coordinate frames and give predictions for the bottom capsule coordinate frames. The predictions are depicted via crosses in the lower capsule representation space on left. Take these predictions as the center of the Gaussians in a Gaussian mixture model. Each of the part capsules picks the closest prediction as its parent. We learn the transformations and the MLP by optimizing the lower capsule coordinate frames under the predicted Gaussian mixture model. In addition to eliminating the loop, now this can be trained without supervision. It's a complete autoencoder, essentially. Let's take a look at the task that we started with. We color the points based on which parent they choose in the CAPSnet. We see that the CAPSnet finds the true underlying common parents in most cases. We compare our model with a baseline, which has a decoder with several layers rather than single matrix transformation. All ad other aspects are kept the same. We compare the percentage of points that don't get grouped together. We see that the capsule autoencoder is significantly better at finding the underlying pattern without supervision. 
Assuming that viewpoint varies between images, capsule autoencoders can easily disentangle viewpoint from shape. During the past 40 minutes, we covered motivation for capsule research, introduced basic elements of a capsule network, talked about figuring out agreements and assignments. Uh, we have learned why finding agreement is advantageous to summing up evidence. Also, we have learned how to get smart sparsification and scene parsing via assigning parts to objects. We also gave three examples of practical techniques for accomplishing these functions. And that's about it. Thank you. Let's now take a look at the questions.